So thanks a lot, everyone, for joining for this webinar today around impact of generative AI on IT services. And uh, today we have with us uh, uh, three experts from Happiest Minds, Mr. Sridhar Manta, who is the Chief Technology Officer of Happiest Minds based out of Seattle. And along with him, we have Mr. Sahil Makkar, who is the Principal Data Scientist at Happiest Minds, and Mr. Ritesh Gupta, VP and CTO of Product Engineering Services. Uh, so I think just to quickly set the agenda, uh, uh, just to make a quick disclosure first, uh, the panelists are not going to discuss the forward-looking statements in terms of the revenue growth guidance or EBITDA margin guidance for the company or how the quarter is looking like. But this is more like a tech talk in terms of what is going to be the impact of generative AI on the IT services contracts and the various service lines. So the agenda is... Uh, uh, Shridhar will start with the brief overview around the impact of generative AI and the four or five key agenda points they have in their mind, which are, you know, the top of mind of everyone. And then we can get into the Q&A session. Uh, so I would get, I would suggest if, you know, all three of you, Shridhar, Sahil and Ritesh, if you can very briefly give your background to us, how long you have been with Happiest Minds and your journey prior to that so that your participants can direct the questions to you accordingly. So over to you, Shudha, to start the proceedings. Thank you very much. Uh, I, as shared, uh, my name is Sridhar Manta, and uh, I've been in the industry for close to 30 years, and uh, I did my computer science, master's in computer science from ISC in 94, and I worked in India for six years, and after that, I've been working in U.S., and my expertise is in building internet scale systems and I've been working on the AI and the data side of the things as well as multiple uh, aspects of the software development. I've been with Happiest Minds pretty much from the inception and with the Happiest Minds for close to 11 years. So, sorry, I'm Ritesh, Ritesh Gupta. Uh, about over two decades of industry experience, Working with Happiest Minds, typically uh, from, from the time of inception, like 11 years, my primary focus in Happiest Minds is to evaluate the newer technologies uh, which comes and, and see how it's going to disrupt the industry as a whole and particularly for our clients and accordingly make investments, create offerings, create pitches for the, for the customer and then definitely building their technology experiences. So my name is Sahil and I'm based out in Bangalore. I'm with Happiest Mind for last three and a half years, total 17 year work experience. So I belong to a team called CEO Analytics and my team takes care of anything to do with AI data, you know, what is happening in the new in the AI field. And today, one of the topics that we are taking on the generative AI also, you know, comes from the AI side of it. Thank you very much, uh, Sahil. Uh, so as uh, Sumit shared, probably I'll spend 15 to 20 minutes giving our point of view and what our experience in this is. And uh, uh, in terms of how this technology is going to influence, of course, there is some kind of, based on our understanding, I may uh, share some point of view there. But of course, none of us have crystal ball here. However, based on our experience with previous disruptive technologies, as well as our understanding of the AI, I'll be able to share some information. And after that, we'll uh, take it more as an interactive conversation. And then uh, me and my colleagues will be in a position to address any of the questions that you have. Okay. So, since the topic is, uh, even though with the chat GPT, there's a lot of uh, attention that is happening in the industry for the last five to six months, we want to look at it in the broader context of the generative AI. Now, as a definition, I'm sure like everybody who's part of uh, this webinar has a reasonable context about what generative AI is. But in a basic English, we are trying to create information that didn't exist earlier. Right. It could be as simple as a question and answers that uh, many people are trying today with chat GPT or I'll give a one line and I want an image to be created. And in many other uh, scenarios, A is trying to create the information that wasn't existing earlier which is different from using AI for insights and other activities. And generative AI as such has a rich history that spans over five years, beginning with the development of generative adversarial networks, GANs, and some of you might be aware of deepfakes. It was quite popular at that point. It's 
some point in time of uh, president of united states giving a speech which he never gave for example and uh, there's concept like transformer models etc and now of course in the last several months we are hearing more report uh, gpts uh, and uh, the, there is a significant impact in the market primarily because of the showcasing the chat gpt has done on the potential of uh, gpt technology or what we call as large language models so in a way it is more like an iphone moment uh, as an analogy what i meant by that is like there have been smartphones before iphone and of course there have been many smart phones after iphone also but that moment just created a large leap and we can also consider uh, the the kind of quality of the chat gpt 3.5 as an iphone moment in the industry and that suddenly opened up the whole space and there is a lot more action picked up in the non text areas also like more of images videos where generative ai is creating information that wasn't existing at all Uh, and a technology like this uh, as is such horizontal and broadly applicable and ya has been also viewed more like an electricity earlier in the sense that pretty much every industry and every kind of application earlier was leveraging uh, artificial intelligence and now we are looking at an opportunity for what kind of applications can leverage text based generative ai something like chat gpt as well as other kinds of generative ai where it is images or test cases i'll touch upon that as we go forward within happier minds uh, since our primary focus from the inception has been always to look at the disruptive technologies as part of our annual strategy process we actually look at uh, constantly what are the technologies that are on the horizon and we very similarly looked at the generative ai uh, approximately 3 to 4 years back along with other disruptive technologies at that point in time uh, and 2 3 years back itself we started working on uh, creating multiple prototypes and working with customers in various contexts like some of the examples at that point in time is we created like a deep fake kind of uh, solutions for a media company right and converting 2d images to 3d images right and when we are trying to create a 3d image with less number of 2d images there is not really much uh, information that is available again generative ai is used to create the 3d images and we also looked at like leveraging it for creating the test cases for the test automation etc now uh this is all the history now post chat gpt release of course everybody in the industry suddenly realized that uh, large language models have taken a massive leap right and uh, it is not only the open ai the company behind chat gpt uh, as well as bard kind of solution from google there is a lot more traction and action happening in the open source community also in the last 3 to 4 months and uh, it is very clear at this point in time that there is going to be multiple large language models and this technology is going to stay here so uh, many of our customers who fall into various verticals are constantly looking at in the last three months because it is such a disruption that is happening and how we can leverage it right and that way like we are seeing uh, interest and uh, an active participation and consideration on how it can be leveraged uh, across multiple verticals and i'll touch upon few examples there in various verticals uh, edutech uh, or education space for example right it is a classic situation where the students can always leverage a ai based tutor right where they can always ask what kind so any clarification that they have on any particular subject they have and they can do a back and forth with a chat gpt kind of technologies and when we looked at it it is uh, not like eighth grade history or seventh grade english right the, in the current uh, incarnation of the form itself like uh, chat gpt 4.0 for example it is able to actually converse reasonably well with even degree level physics questions and clarifications back and forth right of course uh, there, there are certain limitations but one can always say that it is 94% plus accurate in many of the conversations a student can have so a based tutor kind of thing right and having an instructor assistant kind of right like based on the student information a much more personalized uh, support can be provided to the student because uh, the student context can be taken by the large language models when they are conversing back and forth other thing is creating flashcards 
right? When there's a chapter that exists, a student can always create a set of flashcards. And even those flashcards also can be highly customized based on the student's strengths and weaknesses uh, that is captured by the learning solutions or learning management solutions. And there are many solutions in the edutech. And of course, there are concerns also by some of our customers in the edutech space. Uh, the biggest concern uh, at this point, which is applicable for many of other customers also, is uh, in the current incarnation of leveraging ChatGPT, uh, I'm sending my information outside of my company. Right. And there's a lot of IPR proprietary information that I have. And unless the solutions mature, I cannot leverage it. So the security kind of concerns that exist. Within uh, healthcare space, of course, there's a lot of research and analyzation of the data that can happen uh, because in the healthcare space, a lot of patient information is text documents, right? There's a lot of textual back and forth kind of information the doctors fill, nurses fill, and all kinds of things happen. And a lot of this textual information can be easily processed and analyzed further by large language models like ChatGPT. Right. And also a related problem is there's a lot of unstructured data, which is the patient information, and how do we extract structured data out of it, which is a classic problem uh, for many fields, and it is a bigger problem in the healthcare space, and large language models can be easily trained so that even though the information is scattered across a document, and even if the sentences are written in a different way, because one doctor writes in a particular way, another nurse writes in a particular way, etc., all that English can be easily understood and the right kind of information can can be extracted. The third and the last vertical I'll briefly touch upon is uh, uh, in the BFSI space, right? And uh, now this is where like the, there's a lot of interest uh, at this point in time. And of course, there's a lot of, uh, one can say, the over-enthusiasm also in the sense that uh, the, the ability of a large language models to parse the financial reports of the companies and even to the level of uh, making recommendations on what kind of stocks to purchase. Right. So people are pushing the intelligence to that kind of level. But even if we think that is future and leave it for a minute at this point in time, but there's a lot of textual information that exists in the financial industry. Right. And there's a lot of like junior analysts who are responsible to create it, analyze it, go through the reports, extra. Right. All those things can be completely uh, automated. Right through ChatGPT kind of or a large language models kind of solution, and also the second and last one briefly I'll touch upon is in the BFSI is whenever you have a lot of regulations. Now the same can be applicable in the manufacturing or other industries, right? And uh, there's a lot of legal work that happens around the regulations. Like, am I violating a particular regulation by doing something? Right? All that information going through a large body of the regulations and the system responding, those can be easily done. And there are many many horizontal solutions that exist, uh, which are applicable across multiple domains. I just touched upon a few just to give a flavor at this point. I mean, later in the question and answers, if any specific example anybody would like to discuss, I will be happy to address that. And in terms of what we are doing and uh, as a preparation, right? Now, the, the large language models as a space is going to evolve uh, from now to the next one year, two years, three years. Right. Uh, however, at this point in time, we, what we are having is a glimpses of what the technology is capable of. And even though OpenAI itself is like rapidly trying to evolve it and Google is trying to do things, et cetera, et cetera. And in terms of the programmatic, cap programmatic capabilities, limited capabilities are being exposed by OpenAI, but we have some sense about the, the direction, right? Uh, so the, 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 the few areas we are looking at at this point in time is the fundamental or the very first thing that every customer of us want to know and do is, Okay, ChatGPT kind of solution is super cool and super good, but I have my own knowledge body, right? Uh, if I want uh, ChatGPT or any of these solutions to draft an email for me, that is pretty cool and interesting. But I would like to converse again as a large volume of the information that I have. Like an, as an example, uh, there's like, I do have one of our customers, they, they have 10,000 uh, manuals for various products. Right, And uh, they want the field support people to actually do a conversation back and forth based on those manuals. Now, of course, naturally, ChatGPT has no understanding about any of these, right? So from that point of view, like, uh, how do we make sure that a solution like ChatGPT or large language models can work with our own or the customer's own uh, knowledge repository? Now, this problem is applicable across 
all the verticals, right? In the education space, it's all the students' learning behaviors I have, as well as the textbooks. If it is a BFSI, then I have all these financial reports that exist, right? Uh, if it is like a health tech, there's a lot of research information they have. So that is one problem where there are two sub-solutions that exist. One is a more of an in-context kind of search where the context of the user's question, again, is my own knowledge body the relevant paragraphs will be taken and passed to large language models so that a chat GPT can actually answer for that. The second solution is actually I can fine tune the model so that whatever is the internet and the text information chat GPT kind of solution crawled in the past, I'll try to make it do one more crawling against my own repository, right? The second category we are looking at is we do strongly believe that uh, this is eventually going to be multiple players are going to be there. Naturally, OpenAI plus Microsoft is a strong contender at this point in time based on the early lead they're having. And one cannot completely rule out Google, even though they're a little bit behind at this point in time, but they have won many races in the past. Right. So surely they'll uh, try to compete strongly in the near future to the midterm. And the third and the large player we are strongly we strongly believe will win in this race also is open source ecosystem so we are very closely observing the open source ecosystem and there have been a lot of developments that are happening in the last three months and some of the things that cannot be done with open AI at this point and for example we are trying to see how we can actually do with the open source uh, foundational models that are being put uh, by the community. Of course, the quality of them will continue to improve at this point. And one can argue saying that they're anywhere between 80 to 95% closer to the quality of chat GPT. The last category, which is very important for us is the, the improvement or the productivity improvements that can happen as part of the overall engineering process. Right, because uh, historically we have been having all kinds of productivity improvement tools as part of the engineering process. Right, uh, like uh, if you go all the way back, starting with assembly language to having an IDE or development tools to simpler programming languages like Python, etc., to uh, all kinds of frameworks and tools are constantly coming. And we also consider ChatGPT and large language models as uh, a significant productivity improvement tool as part of the overall engineering process. So now, when I say overall engineering process, now one can break it into multiple parts, and we tend to look at it always as its ability to write code. Right? I'll touch upon that also briefly. However, there are a lot more activities that happen as part of the overall engineering process also, right? Uh, the, the design process, sometimes like somebody else wrote the code and I have to maintain it. So the maintenance process starts with understanding the code, right? And also we are looking at the test case generation. Right. I already do have a code, then the QA team has to sit and write test cases. So what can I do there? Right. So uh, our view on this is various activities in overall engineering process will have varying degrees of productivity enhancements or improvements. Right. Certain activities may see larger improvements. Like, uh, for example, I would like to write unit test cases for all the code that I developed. Right. Which is a much easier problem to solve for a solution like ChatGPT or uh, Star Code or, or any other large language model because I'm typically looking at 30, 50, 70 lines of code, which is my function or a method or a class, and I would like to write a unit test case uh, against that. Uh, and when developers are working, if they're stuck with any particular problem or an issue, rather than Googling, they can always actually uh, check their code against a ChatGPT kind of solution or GitHub's Copilot X kind of solution to get benefit out of it. And uh, uh, infrastructure deployment, there is significant uh, benefit that we can see in those cases because infrastructure deployment scripts and monitoring scripts are generally smaller pieces of code, right? And uh, when we consider a large, massive enterprise class systems, no way at this point in time any of the solutions or even chat GPT is in a position to consider the end-to-end -end, uh, code base, but however, it can actually help the developers with the snippets of the code. So those are the things we are constantly looking at and we're evaluating and we are rolling out as part of our organization some of these best practices. And we'll continue to evolve our strategy as the market is evolving. What I meant by that is like when 3.5 or Shard GPT came, like there is a lot of enthusiasm and interest and the query quickly reached to 10 million and at this point in time, 100 million users. And we all understand its capability. But however, from the enterprise applications point of view and ability to integrate it with the Shard GPT kind of solutions, those things are slowly coming out. Like they released the API subsequently, 
then of course 4.0 came then they released the capability to do the plugin development and microsoft also is trying to do something more with their own development tools on how to use it etc there are few specific uh, points i would like to address before i give the floor back to the members who joined right uh, some of the questions i believe uh, that generally come up in these kind of conversations are uh, the, the the first one is like uh, what kind of opportunities this technology opens up right for especially indian it companies and some elements of that i already covered more from the verticals point if you like healthcare uh, as well as it you take i have taken and quite a few horizontal solutions exist and uh, now the, there is always a fear of uh, any time a new technology comes what jobs will go away immediately right where where it could have the significant amount of impact and in, in our opinion now of course none of us have a crystal ball at this point in time but based on the knowledge that we have i'm making a little bit of extrapolation on the overall industry the business process outsourcing the bpo services typically will be the first ones that will be affected the the more this technology matures right because the the there is an automation always happening in the business process right historically if it is 50 years back or a number of years back there was zero automation and we are completely doing 100% manual now slowly with computers and then creating workflows the the human participation versus the systems participation that ratio is constantly changing but still there is a reasonable amount of human activity that happen as part of the overall uh, business workflows now with this technologies especially in certain business workflows the human participation will come down even more drastically the simplest example i can take is uh, the publishing industry right and there is always a proofreaders for example right uh, the content creators uh, co- people like editor the, the junior editors who are checking the content etc etc right many of those jobs potentially can be taken away uh, the medical transcrib- transcribing kind of activities so there are some jobs where the automation can happen more in some jobs surely some more automation will come into picture the second and the last one i'll touch upon is uh, which potentially can have the largest impact is customer support especially at the l1 level or the very first touch point on the customer support now there has been efforts or attempts that were being made in the last several years to create bots right what we call as chatbots right and many of us as consumers also attempted to use these chatbots and none of us were very very happy with the chatbots right always we wanted to talk to a human being because the chatbots can actually solve only the point problems now we are actually with the technologies like chat gpt the customer support bots right are going to take a major leap right and it makes a lot more sense and user adoption also will go up drastically so that way the customer support right the telephone support and outsourcing that happened around it that also will have significant amount of impact now the the doomsday prediction of software development roles will vanish uh, we don't believe that at all because we also consider this as another productivity enhancement to i'll touch upon that uh, in a context of a different point the other question that comes up is generally to create this kind of solutions right what kind of qualified people are required right both in the indian it industry as well as globally also uh, in our opinion right especially personally when i have seen the last 30 years right 30 years back in the early days of uh, at least when i started uh, my college days like people used to even if they write in cobol or even if they write in cr assembly all these languages are very very close to how the systems were representing the data so the barrier of entry at that point in time was very very high for people to learn either cobol or whether to learn even the computer science you have to even understand how memory is getting managed inside the computer right when you're writing in c and uh, to think today somebody to implement an ai algorithm like a clustering for example i was talking to sahil about this imagine writing something like that in assembly language i'm absolutely positive to that it will take easily like 10 years or 15 years for somebody to write a clustering algorithm or a recommendation in assembly language but today with python and tensorflow one can write it in 10 15 minutes right so very similarly like uh, the, the 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 productivity is going to grow drastically and uh, 
what is happening in the industry is there always are easier programming task and difficult programming task what i meant by easier programming task is in some situations the front end html css and little bit of javascript very simple website development is a simpler development right now one can say that a person with high school with three months four months php development experience can always do a small website uh, with 10 pages in php right but when we take an enterprise class application that falls into the other side of the spectrum and that's where we need right with all the productivity improvement tools very competent people now with chat gpt kind of and generative ai technologies those two groups are going to be even more segregated further what we meant by that is an easier projects and easier programming tasks can be easily automated or heavily or 90 70 percent productivity improvements you can get with chat gpt however when somebody has to write an enterprise class application then solutions like chat gpt turns into productivity enhancement tools because anytime chat gpt says this is a code potentially you can use or this is a function you can potentially use you need somebody who can understand to tell that hey line number 10 has a problem can you fix it and give a better code back to me that means the person who is taking the help of chat gpt for developing complex applications should be knowledgeable enough so instead of writing 100 lines of the code i potentially can ask chat gpt to give me that code then i can converse back and forth and i can tell that like hey you forgot to handle exceptions or some boundary condition you missed or this algorithm is not very efficient can you change it right then i get the final code so instead of me spending what a one week to get that right that code now i'm spending more like six hours or four hours only i'm just taking some random numbers here to illustrate my point however i'm reasonably knowledgeable in how to write it myself that's how i was able to do the conversation back and forth right as opposed to just taking whatever code comes out and on the other side or the easier side of the situation it is pretty straightforward right i would like a php website with two pages and user comes in and clicks the button does some things like that cool i got the code most likely it will work so that way in terms of the competency of the people who will be using this as a tool right so there will be like uh, at the entry level developers as well as for the easier projects the barrier of entry will come down a little bit and on the senior level and the complex programming side the barrier goes up however the overall productivity will improve and as i mentioned earlier in some cases it may improve all the way up to 70 percent in certain tasks in some tasks it will improve more like a 10 to 20 percent and that quantification is what we are doing as our internal exercises and internal deployments the last point i want to touch upon is uh, uh, the, the insourcing versus outsourcing right anytime a new disruptive technology comes since of course happiest minds is uh, an outsourced uh, digital it services company the first thing is uh, that comes into our mind as well as first thing everybody looks at is will customers try to build this capability in-house initially or will they actually rely upon partners at the initial stages right now what our experience has shown with multiple disruptive technologies and the close the the most recent successful example i can take is iot right four to five years back when iot has come there is an adoption cycle customers follow right anytime a technology comes when I, iot came every manufacturing plant in the world every industrial customer in the world knew that iot can help them but it doesn't necessarily mean that on the day one they can jump they need to wait for the technology to mature there's a maturity maturity cycle of the technology right they initially explore what use cases are possible they'll try to do some kind of prototypes initially they'll try to do 1.0 then at that point and they'll scale up right and in those iterations the technology landscape drastically was changing right like if five years back if, if we look back and whatever we thought at that point time will be the winners as iot platforms i doubt many of them exist today right so there'll be a lot of flux in the initial stages and enterprise customers are not willing at that point in time to really build capability not jump in at that point in time and we surely do see very similar trend also at this point in time and customers already are talking about use cases they have concerns about security there is an exploration about how technology can solve their use cases and then they're redefining and refining their use cases based on what technology can do today 
right? Because we tend to think A is magic, but if that technology doesn't exist today, they have to tweak it. So those activities will continue to happen. And once the technology matures, at that point in time, it turns into a very stable kind of, right? Like the customers will have in-house as well as outsourcing happening. That's a pretty long uh, monologue from me. Hopefully, I was able to convey our position and our point of view and what we have been doing. And uh, Sumit, uh, at this point, I would like to turn the tables. Unless Ritesh and Sahil, you have anything to add? Uh, no, no, Sridhar, nothing from my side. You covered it. You covered all the points. Let's hear from the other side. Yeah, I'm good as well, Sridhar. Okay, great. Uh, thanks a lot, Shridhar, for sharing those insights. Just a reminder to all the participants, if you have any question, then you can please raise your hands and you can go ahead with your question. So just to begin with a very simple, basic question, which comes to everybody's mind in terms of, you know, how many number of projects have you done till now in the last three to six months incorporating generative AI? And what has been the productivity benefit or, you know, changes in the contract terms in terms of pricing per person or the profitability or, you know, the turnaround time, if you can, if you can highlight any use case in which you have been caught by this. Sure, Sumit. So this is where, like earlier, I was touching upon the technology adoption cycle, right? So at this point in time, many of the discussions as well as activities we are doing, right? the projects we are doing with the customers in a collaborative fashion, you can consider them as a prototyping kind of, right? Uh, one of the large logistics uh, customer of ours, and that's where I have taken the example of 10,000 manuals they have, right? And uh, now I'll take that problem for a minute and explain that's one project as well as then I'll give the number to you, right? So in a problem like that, of course, we understand chat GPT is pretty good with the text, right? And we are talking about PDFs here. Right. And many of us have looked at the PDFs that have images and bullet points and things like that. Right. So there is a reasonable amount of complexity in terms of converting the PDFs into the text files. Right. And also, then there are reasonable amount of limitations today with ChatGPT. What I meant by that is if you are trying to ask ChatGPT, for example, a question, right, that question has a particular context. Right. In this context, answer this question. Right. Then it will use its reasoning capabilities. What the context it can you can pass has a limitation of what is called as tokens. That means approximately 4,000 words is all you can pass as a context. That means if you have a 10-page document, you cannot give the 10-page document to chat GPT and say that now let me converse the questions back and forth. So there are other solutions around this which are rapidly evolving and it actually originally started from Facebook as an open source project. So there are a lot of other ecosystem components we had to put together right, to demonstrate that this is how it can be solved. right? So those are the kind of activities we are doing at this point in time with our customers. So, so that, and another customer, like they want to actually use open source large language models. However, they are not really as to the quality of uh, chat GPT, but we are actually using them also to do. So the point is there is, there are reasonable amount of restrictions and there are only, only so much actually open AI has given as APIs to us. Right, in terms of like programmatic integration and programmatically to do it. And open source also has its own limitation. So, so that way we are actually working with multiple customers on different kinds of use cases to solve different kinds of problems. However, as a study larger projects, that will happen as a prototypes to 1.0 to launch into a larger project. And that adoption cycle generally, in my opinion, takes six to 12 months based on the past experiences. I guess it's still too early to comment in terms of project profitability and the pricing. Is that correct? Yes. yes. So now as an engineering productivity improvement, if I use chat GPT, right? Like I, I believe the question is, if I have a mobile development project, mobile application, which is which takes 12 person months as of yesterday, right? The question, if I frame it in slightly different fashion, if I'm using chat GPT kind of technologies today, Will the 12 person months come down to six person months or nine person months, right? Or three person months? That is a question. So that either I pass part of it to the customer and I part of it I'll put in my own pocket. Right. And that is where a lot of interest exists at this point in time for many people. However, there are quite a few challenges today 
to actually even start using it. Because for a lot of people, I, I'm sure like many of us came across the Samsung news article. For some customers, like they were very particular of not at all using chat GPT to do any queries or questions based on their code base, right? And we are actually looking at open source solutions like a star coder, which is an open source model. It is reasonably okay, kind of. So code is actually an IP for many of our customers. So it's not that easy for us to send back and forth our code to chat GPT. They are extremely nervous about it. And Th that is where we are actually looking at, we are doing two things. One is in the overall engineering process, where are the gains? As I mentioned earlier, the unit test case generation, there is a significant amount of gains we have seen, right? However, when you are writing enterprise class applications, we are seeing gains as okay kind of percentages. So those are the ones we are computing and calculating. And when customers are nervous about actually their code or their design, as a question and answer also going outside, right? We are actually looking at the open source solutions right? Uh, star, model, star Coder is one of the models that we are looking at. So those things are still in very, very infancy stage. So those are the measures that we are doing, right? At this stage, all I can say is surely there'll be X percentage improvement. What that X, I don't think anybody in the industry has an understanding. I can make a guess if you want, but my guess is as good as anybody else's guess in this forum. And it also depends upon the nature of the project. If I'm doing infrastructure management project, as I mentioned earlier, right? All I'm doing is writing more of the infrascripts shell scripts or puppet scripts or whatever, there the, the gains are much higher because each script is much smaller. But if I'm writing a Java massive three-tier application, then generally the gains will become smaller because the overall project cannot be taken as a context by these models. Right, I, didn't right. give, I, didn't, I didn't give a number to you. All you wanted is a number, but I'm giving the context in which all of us are operating. No, right, Shridhar. I guess uh, yesterday in the Accenture results, they mentioned that the chat GPT movement is similar to the SaaS adoption in terms of initially it might have some negative implication, but in the longer term, there will be a lot of scope for implementation for IT services companies yeah. and overall broader set of uh, technology adoption. So do you buy that view and are you seeing a similar sort of things? Uh, are, oh, sure. are your clients asking for any productivity benefits to be shared with them? Sure. So now the thing is like, when we are talking about engineering process, right? Uh, many of our clients are also doing engineering themselves, right? A lot of times when we are actually using any of the tools, we generally tend to mirror the tools. And anytime if we come up with any better tool, we actually mirror that to the customers also because the customers also either they have the MNCs or they have their own engineering teams in US or Europe or wherever it is, right? And before we even address the question of like IT services companies, are you using any of these as part of your engineering process? We have to see the broader industry. I'll even ignore for a minute IT services company, even the, the generic product development companies or IT organizations, they are also at this point, I'm skeptical because at this stage, there are only two solutions that exist for anybody to effectively use. One is using the chat GPT itself, where you're directly pasting your code on a web browser and the code is going and coming back. I'm telling what is the reality today. There is nothing else that exists apart from these two, right? Where you are copy pasting your code or your design points into the browser window and it is going to open AI and it is giving the code back to you or you're giving the code, it is saying so and so error exists. So back and forth, your information is 100% going to chat GPT, open AI. The second and the last solution that exists at this point in time is um, by GitHub, which is again a Microsoft company, where it is actually integrated as part of your development environment, what they call as a Copilot X. And that is actually in the beta stage. And that also will be sending back and forth your code to GitHub. Right? These are the only two solutions that exist at this point in time. Of course, however, you can actually do other kinds of things, again, by using the web interface. Their APIs by OpenAI is very similar to what you can do on the web. It isn't anything great or much more you can do using their APIs apart from what you can do on the web page. Got it, got it. No, thanks, Shridhar. So I think however, I, I can sorry. see a lot of... Yeah, so I'll just... I'll conclude, sorry, I'll conclude that by saying that uh, what Exchange is saying now, there were some technologies when they come onto the surface, right? Uh, we, we all get excited and we jump into that, right? Of course, as industry. However, some technologies will be staying perpetually. Some technologies will not be taking really 
rather they don't take off really and some technologies just die in the early stages or maybe they may come back in the different form what i meant by that is like when iot started we all know that iot is going to be here now whether it will take one year for the everybody but it took really long time for the manufacturing industry to adopt it as part of the manufacturing 4.0 right especially the large players also so but we do know iot is going to stay right when you look at something like a blockchain and crypto right even though there was a lot of excitement around it we still consider the blockchain as like it has a very small role to play but it's a very important and crucial role to play in a certain segments only right and third and last example if you have to pick meta last year metaverse right that is not a horizontal technology it is a very narrow kind of solution and if we get a greatest device from apple or somebody else tomorrow then only it can take off now that being the context we do strongly believe that this is a technology that is going to stay here and it has a fundamental ability to impact so now the comparison can be with saas could be with anything but initially they're going to be teething errors security is a par- biggest concern and people don't want to give their information they want to see how the dust it is all those things will be there just like early saas days yeah, i agree got it got it no thanks sir for that uh, maybe i can ask can i ask abhishek jain to please go ahead and ask the question abhishek can you unmute yourself and ask yes hi okay uh, hi i am unmuted myself can you hear me Yes sir. yes yes sir yes hi hi so uh, thank you very much for the time i sort of just wanted to sort of um, like a uh, uh, first like high level question in terms of how big do you think generative ai can be for you in a few years i mean i'm sure, i mean it's not trying to get like near term or whatever because i think one one did read the announcement of hiring 1300 people for generative ai and so i'm sure there's like a sort of a plan to it so i wasn't like sort of if you could also help us understand if most of these have been hired or like over what time do you think these hires would come what kind of function it is right and uh, in 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 the sense is it more sales more product development so just just get, just help us like frame the generative ai opportunity for you um, uh, sort of from a from a next 2 3 year perspective sure so i, I think the the point rather the way we look at it is especially when it comes to the hiring side of things right maybe sunil can also add a little bit more to that G- generally we as i mentioned earlier our focus always has been on the disruptive technologies right mm-hmm. anytime we look at our expansion plans and hiring whatever is a number each year when we are hiring when we are getting the projects when we are going to the market we always tend to take what is new right because mm-hmm. that is the edge of the digital and that's what our position is that's what is the foundation of the company and na- naturally at different points in time different components of these disruptive technologies take a little bit more lead right and at this point and uh, of course ai has been always there uh, as a little bit underlying and iot takes a little bit more forefront at some point time at some point we looked at the combination of metaverse and blockchain kind of things take a little bit of uh, edge and at this point in time of course ai more than generative ai broadly the ai has once again came into forefront out of the disruptive technologies so naturally all our investments and hiring will happen within the dif- disruptive technologies category and naturally right now ai is looking like that and that's where the numbers are coming into picture now that being said like we do strongly believe that even though we are talking today right now about generative ai i want to expand it a little bit within 30 seconds right we need to look at what enabled a solution like chat gpt to come today right the same enablers will actually help the other ai components or other kinds of ai what i meant by that is even though the chat gpt is at forefront right to actually create a model like chat gpt right uh because even if you look at any of the small open source models we are looking at something like a 60 billion parameters right people are talking about trillion words it actually crawled now the, the significant amount of uh, technological shift or enablement actually happened by nvidia and hardware right the ability to use the graphics cards to do machine learning and then nvidia heavily pushing themselves into the ai chipset kind of company and a cpu less server with eight of their a100 uh, graphics cards massive servers and then in cloud our ability to actually rent and lease extremely powerful machines that can actually process a models like this right so now if we consider that is an enabler of course there is an innovation or an algorithm 
right, around uh, large language models. And there are more and more innovation is also happening there in terms of the model updates and everything. So now the enablers of the, the large language models is going to enable other kinds of AI also very rapidly because the, the, the hardware and the, the technology is available for many of us to quickly create models and play with it. Hence, we do believe that beyond large language models, a lot more is going to happen. And then if I have to go with the SAS uh, analogy Smith has given, right? Earlier, there used to be more of a horizontal SAS solutions, and then subsequently, they became more of a verticalized SAS solutions. Very similarly, at some point in time, a generic horizontal solution like ChatGPT will not be sufficient. We'll be having more of verticalized solutions. What I meant that is financial GPT, right? So where the model is highly trained towards that or uh, tuned towards financial documents and financial information. And even though OpenAI at this point are heavily pushing their own model for code also, we surely will be seeing code-oriented GPT solutions. Like that, maybe there'll be a legal GPT solution where it is furthermore fine-tuned towards the legal documents, the legal information or a compliance GPT. So we will be seeing this market exploding in all places, right? That being said, when we look at the opportunity, right, and from the capability point of view, right, we actually see it at three levels, right? And of course, view it like a V kind of thing, more people on the top and a little easier and the bottom less people and more complicated, right? The, the first category is the larger pool of people, they'll be leveraging the generate VA within their workflow, right, within their activities. Now, this could be engineering or non-engineering, right? Suppose there is a maintenance project and uh, I was given code, I'll take the help of large language models so that they can actually go through the code and tell me what the design is rather than me going through all code and figuring it out and things of that nature, right? And a little bit of test scripts it can generate for me, et cetera, et cetera. The second in the mid category is we have to integrate as part of our customer solution, a third party generative AI solution. Right. What I meant by that is now let us say like I'm building a learning management solution for students. Right. As part of my overall solution, I would like to have a virtual tutor. That means like in a bigger solution that I'm building, I'll be integrating chat GPT or BARD or any open source solution or any third party generated AI solution. So it's more of an integration. Right. And that requires moderate capabilities. The third and la most complicated where we'll be having smaller number of people is in building generated AI solutions ourselves. Right. Sometimes, since I mentioned the vertical solution, we're not talking about we are going to build a foundational model like chat GPT. Right? We are talking about fine-tuning the existing models. That is where the world is going to move very quickly. Right? Fine-tuning the existing models based on the customer's own sub-vertical. Right? As I mentioned, this lake compliance GPT as an example I have taken. Right? Or on the customer's own knowledge repository. So within generative AI space itself, like we see at all three levels, and then beyond the generative AI within the AI space, Today, it is pretty much in every project that we do. What I meant by that is like, today you cannot build an enterprise class system without thinking about the underlying data layer and what kind of AI it is going to be there, right? So that way, like when we are doing something like a 40 people, 50 people kind of project, there'll be always three, four people who are like AI specialists. It could be both on the statistics side or ML side, et cetera, as well as few people who are constantly look at the data side of things. So that way we consider AI also like depending upon the nature of the project, it, it will be always there in those projects. I hope I, I, I gave a complete picture there. Yeah, no, this is quite helpful. Thank you very so, much. Uh, Abhishek, uh, just one data point or a correction. Yeah. The 1300 number that you spoke about is planned lateral plus campus additions for fiscal 22, 24, mm -hmm. not necessarily into AI. Okay, okay. There's a to total number. Okay, yeah. got it, got it. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks, Abhishek, for those questions. Uh, can I ask Vishwamitra to please go ahead and unmute yourself and ask the question? Thanks very much for this uh, session. Uh, very, very insightful. So I just have a, a couple of questions. So firstly, you talked about it a little bit earlier about uh, the impact of the insourcing, how we can see some insourcing, some uh, little bit of outs, uh, continue to be outsourced. To. So I just wanted to uh, you know, double click on this a little bit. So if we look at, for example, the major service lines of IT service companies, like application development, you talked about the impacts of general on that, the infrastructure management and maintenance solutions, the BPO, and also perhaps like the ERP implementations. 
where would we see more insourcing? You know, if we look at the overall services uh, set for five sure. seven companies, where would we see uh, less risk of insourcing? Sure. So <clears throat> the, there is this thought process or the fear that I heard from if not directly from you, I'm slightly reframing the question also. And if that doesn't answer, I'll come to the other specifics also, right? If there is significant amount of the product gains, will there be outsourcing? It's a fundamental question, right? So today, uh, as a CTO or a VP engineering of a product company, let us say, right? I need to have 100 people to work on my project. And I all I can hire here in US is 50 people. Hence, I'm going to happiest minds and asking them to give me 50 more people work on the project, right? That is generally the model by which the Indian IT services companies operate. Now you take that as a 50-50, sometimes 30-70, 90-10, whatever are the ratios, right? Now, if the productivity improvements of the customer goes as double the productivity, now I can hire 50 people in US as a head of engineering of a company and I won't be outsourcing. Is the logical uh, problem that we face. That being said, at least in, in our experience, what we have seen is anytime a new productivity improvement comes, right? people want to add more features or they want to build more applications. That way, overall IT industry never so slowed down. Right. What I meant by that is like today, if I come with any tool that actually improves the development capabilities or the efficiency of all the IT developers by 1%, that doesn't necessarily mean that 1% lose their jobs everywhere. We'll try to do 101% functionality now, right? That we can see continuously throughout from the day software is born to yesterday, right? So from that perspective, the total volume will continue to keep growing and growing and growing. Sometimes the money will be taken from other buckets into this market, et cetera, right? Now, coming to the insourcing versus outsourcing, right? Now, in a stable situation, customers generally try to keep it balanced, right? And like if I look at any .NET development or a Java development or a test automation development, right? Or a Salesforce implementation, anything, anything that is reasonably matured, customers generally try to keep it as in-house and as well as outsourced. And my point is about the very, very early stage, right? Anytime a new technology comes, like this, right? Will customers try to build the capability internally or do they outsource? And in our experience, in all the prototypes and work we are doing with our customers, right? Their roadmaps are already frozen, right? Their people are already working on their releases. So even though they want to actually work on these things, they cannot move away from their release cycles and their schedules. So they need suddenly a high powered extra bandwidth. And that is where we are coming into picture. And that will continue to happen, right? In the short to mid term. They'll be outsourcing because the, the, the people who are already there, they're really busy and they're not going to be able to hire so quickly, right? Even if they hire one or two people, two, three people, they'll try to take six or eight people from us, right? Because more can be done very quickly. So uh, we have seen very similar kind of cycle as I mentioned earlier with IoT. So we, we do believe that there'll be actually more outsourcing in the initial exploration stages, especially with companies like Happiest Minds who are positioned more as a thought leaders or digital players. So uh, thanks, that's... Uh, um quite helpful so just to clarify what you said you know initially you might have major productivity gains happen but this will always be scope to do a little bit more a little bit extra build on top of that and that kind of skill set i guess would require you know more uh enterprise level code development and uh th that kind of thing so is it fair to say that particular kind of work is a little bit more resilient uh, in terms of uh, 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 continuing with IT service companies uh, for longer, is that fair to say? Fair, fair. So, so I'm, I agree. Like I'm free framing. Like the small, like today also, for example, if any of us go to the internet and try to figure out how ChatGPT is being used, people try to put things like two-page website or three-page websites. Those are like very very small kind of projects, and generally they don't get even outsourced also. Right, it's a little bit of PHP development, three four pages kind of, and Indian IT services, and even if you look at Happiest Minds, like we we are trying to be part of the core uh, 
applications like SaaS solutions our customers are building or the period of multiple years. And that is the reasonably complex systems, right? Those kind of systems where the developers can get productivity gains, but still it requires people who can understand the complexity of the overall solutions only to use the tools, right? Because at the end of the day, the right way to look at it is a tool. You got to know how to use it. And when it doesn't work, you know how to fix it, right? Uh, so that we do believe that uh, that requires a high complexity skill set. And of course, the easier task, easier things that can be done with a low complexity at low qualifications people. Uh, right. Thanks very much. So uh, if I may, just one, one more uh, quick question. So I, it's a broad question. So uh, on the impact of the Indian IT services industry, the, the structure of the industry, you know, uh, with uh, the major players in it and all, is it already kind of apparent from the different positioning of uh, the industry players uh, about who the winners or losers, relative winners or losers, or the guys who would have it a bit more challenging versus a bit easier to capture the option. Is, is that relatively apparent already? And I'm not asking for you to no, necessarily no, it's point out. Sure. It's just, uh, you know, uh, is it clear that there that some people would be advantaged, some, some companies would not? In in my opinion, I think this is more like a massive, uh, this is tsunami or a wave kind of. It is going to lift all the boats, right? Uh, and now, which boat rises faster than which boat is a smaller boat can rise faster than the bigger ships? That is something to speculate only, right? However, in my view, it is actually a massive productivity improvement a tool that is going to be available for everybody. And people do take to the extreme also in the sense that people do position it like English is going to be new programming language, right? These models will become so better. All you need to do is back and forth English communication without knowing anything about software development. And I have my own fears about it because that has been always a holy grail of this whole software development for many, many years. Every time we had uh, hopes like that, but it can be done with very, very simple and easy projects or easy programming tasks only. Sure, Thank, thanks very much. Okay, thanks Vishwa for those questions. Uh, I can see two more hands raised by the participants. So I just want to, I think we are at 10 o'clock. So I just want to check with uh, Sridhar if you have five more minutes to spare. No, sure, sure. No, no, not a problem. I, I think Sunil suggested to keep a little bit of buffer after this. So we are fine. Okay, great, great, great. So Suraj, uh, Kamal, can you go ahead with your question? A simple question. Like uh, uh, in India, we have a uh, like, lot of languages and we have very demographical shifts as well, like uh, North Traverse and right. Uh, so a lot of knowledge occurred in these local languages. How we can leverage that uh, using this thing? So <laughs> I, I, I don't know how many of you tried playing with chat GPT on the Indian languages, right? Now, in my personal opinion, there are two interesting challenges when it comes to uh, large language models and Indian languages, right? Uh, of course, the, the translation is one of the classic situation or a classic example of this, and one can always converse in Spanish or French or Italian, etc. Right? There are actually two problems in my opinion. Right? One is the grammatical structure and the script of the Indian languages is much richer and complicated than English script or English as a language and grammar. Now, of course, there is not there isn't anything inherently in the LLM models and algorithm and an approach uh, that cannot handle a uh, different kind of grammar, right? Uh, the reason why we are able to use large language models, both for Python, as well as English or Java, as well as Italian is all our languages at the end of the day, right? Every language has script and uh, grammar and all it has to do is crawl enough information, right? However, Indian languages are a little more complicated when it comes to grammar, but it has to, the model has to be trained more. So it can solve it, not an issue because it has done for multiple languages already. The second and last problem is the available knowledge or available amount of text that is available 
for the model to be created, right? And when it comes to ChatGPT and OpenAI, when they actually created the foundational model, they have taken certain amount of or the body of knowledge and Indian languages like I did try or played with both Telugu and Marathi, for example. I just want to say not Hindi. Hindi, I assume more text is available. And it attempted something that sounded like Telugu. Uh, I'm, I'm sure like any of you can actually try uh, your own languages. So the, the limitation, at least in my understanding, is it didn't crawl enough body of information. Now, uh, at some point in time, in my personal opinion, I think there is actually, there are already enough initiatives on digitizing all the literature that happened in the Indian languages, right? So that there is enough text or the volume of the text that is available whenever somebody is trying to create foundation model. So my point is inherently the technology is capable of, there are some logistical things that need to be done. And it is just a matter of time because a lot of initiatives happened on digitizing and creating the digital libraries of a lot of the Indian languages, books and information and everything. And it is just a matter of creating the foundational models and tuning them again as the Indian languages. Then the models are reasonably capable of conversing just like they're conversing in English today. Yeah, okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, I can see Jignesh Thakur also raising his hand. Jignesh, can you unmute yourself and go ahead? So my question is on a broader level. Uh, so once this vertical uh, LLM starts to develop and company starts to use them, uh, let's say a company starts using them and saves 10 person hours on a daily basis. So will that, uh, you know, that cause a reduction in employee from the cost benefit uh, perspective? Just from the cost benefit perspective, I, I understand you said that there will be a utilization uh, of or, or the number of type work that will be increased. But just from the current perspective, e, the work will be always be limited, not the, you know, you can't work beyond the things. So how will that be tackled? See, th this is where like the analogy I have given, right? Now, let us say like Microsoft releases Visual Studio, right? Something like that, right? Any development environment. Now that actually improves the developer's productivity by 5%. That doesn't necessarily mean that company has cut 5% of people, right? Historically, always there is a 5%, 1%, 2%, 10%. The, the, the tools are improving the productivity constantly, right? That is where my opinion or my view earlier that then what happens is then the applications become richer and complicated, right? Uh, like what I meant by that is, is, is a, it's an orthogonal topic. Like, for example, Apple released spatial computer, right? Now, of course, this conversation is not about whether it will be succeeding or not, the mixed reality headset, right? Now, they release something like a Vision OS. Now, if it succeeds something like an iPhone, will all the companies, when they created iPhone applications, right, somewhere around 10 to 15 years back, will everybody create an application on Vision OS? Right. So my point is within the way consumers are behaving and within the enterprises, there is a constant change of technologies that is requiring them to create more and more and more. Right. So that way, the, the develop productivity by changing X percent, I don't think people are going to fire X percent of people or drop X percent of people. We all will be doing much, much more. And the same can be told about throughout the human evolution and history, right? Like the, now the productivity improves, we try to do more things. That's my personal opinion. Oh, why, why I'm asking this question is because most of the IT companies hire from the campus and uh, they do a lot of, you know, a low level kind of a job, low paying job that were done. And you mentioned that the complex work that will be needed when the AI will be worked uh, and the complex analogies that will be needed. So not everyone will be able to help with that. So how, you know, that that matter of time, the bigger chunk of the people that are working at the low level of the IT companies, how they will be impacted with these technologies? Sure. So uh, one correction I would like to do is like whenever we hire campus, and of course, three of us who are in the call at some point, and we are the entry-level programmers, right? And of course, at the entry-level Nobody allows you to touch the core modules or the core functionality because we don't have experience to touch that code. We'll generally give an easier kind of task because at some point and the same entry-level programmer whom we hired from the campus is going to turn into our chief architect. 
right? After eight years or 10 years, it's not like they're going to continue to stay only at the low easy tasks, right? Because there's a transition plans that we put as part of like when we hire from the campus, there's going to be training for three months. That's how most of the IT services companies also function, right? They'll be given relatively easier tasks, shadow the people who are currently doing the project so that you'll understand. And then you'll become like easier modules to do, then a little bit more complicated, then you become more of a tech lead, then you become an architect, et cetera. So that's a career path. So my point is the people who start with easier tasks, they'll keep moving to the more and more complicated task as they are moving forward in their career. Now, the second thing is their productivity, right? The easier tasks when they're handling, there appears to be a little bit more gains or more gains in their tasks. But there is, again, there's a lot more demand. And also most of the frameworks or the tools are also becoming easier and easier. What I meant by that is the tools that the development tools that come from Microsoft or open source or the Java tools or even Python as a development and run on frameworks, they're also becoming easier and easier and easier as time progresses, right? That's where I have taken the example of writing a recommendation in assembly language. Now you can do it in five minutes in Python, right? So they're also becoming easier and uh, the, the people who are coming out of the campus, they can do it and we are trying to do more things. So it all gets balanced out, is my opinion. And, and this is the crystal ball question. Now don't come back and say that like, come on, sir, that didn't happen in the last one year after an year. <laughs> no, no. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Shridhar, may, if there is one question on the chat window, uh, so somebody is asking... I can- can, can, you us, us. can you help us understand if there's any impact of GPT on more traditional sectors such as telecom and media? Media is like pretty obvious. I'll start with media, right? <clears throat> so when we looked at the media, actually it became very, very apparent and obvious that like the, the text-based media, it is 100%. Massive impact. It is pretty obvious because large language models are nothing but out of the entire generative AI, the leap we have seen is on the text side of things. So that way, if you are into the publishing industry, on the media side, it is pretty obvious. And I picked the example of the editorial workflows and things of that nature, proofreading, editorial workflows, right? And uh, the, the way we consume as users, right? The information, right? I don't want to sit and read the article, like can LLM summarize for me? Like for example, today, uh, many of us don't go to news websites and read all the news, right? Highly curated news is being delivered to us by Google News or Apple News or anything like that, right? However, still we are responsible to go through the entire article ourselves. Now we can imagine all kinds of use cases here, right? Now, Sunil could be interested, for example, to actually look at the first point and last point right? How the whole article started, how the article ended. So a simple summarization based on Sunil's preference can be done for every article. Whereas I'm really interested to understand the technology angle of the articles, right? So that element can be summarized by chat GPT for me. Like, so what I'm trying to say is like, or maybe Sumit could be interested in financial elements of the article, right? So that way, the way we consume media on the tech side and the way the media is getting created, both the sides, it is going to be changed drastically, right? I picked a few examples and it's pretty apparent at this point in time, right? Now, also when it comes to the, the video side of things, right, on the media, uh, there are interesting uh, things happening there. And uh, the, the role of generative AI, defake, we have done some work and analysis there. And uh, the gaming is the other area which is going to be like, massive disruptions we are expecting, right? Uh, for example, like uh, I'm sure like many people here could have played some kind of games or role-playing games and things of that nature. Video games are pretty static at this point. And you go and click on a character, character says the same thing, nothing more. You click every time it says the same thing. You go and whatever, shoot, kill, play around and come back, right? Now, imagine a situation where like your character goes in and there is a bartender character, right? And you actually can do a conversation completely with that character, right? And now imagine like a real bartender personality is given, right? I had a tough day today in office and you can do that conversation. And other thing which, we has, which surely is happening is uh, chat GPT, we are conversing all well with text, right? We have enough technologies today on audio to text, then chat GPT kind of technology coming into picture and the text coming back as an audio. So basically it's a natural language conversation kind of thing. In the video games, we can easily expect an LLM and chat GPT kind of solution significantly impacting the gaming experience, right? 
and of course the customer support kind of things are there anyway right and when it comes to telecom any time at least specifically on the llms right any time text is there in the workflow there is going to be an impact right and low hanging fruits of the customer support are given anyway right and the moment you start introducing uh, the text to speech and speech to text right like uh, m- many of us could have used alexa or could have used siri or could have used google's at this point in time and if you used it you know that it is very very limited in terms of our ability to converse right all we are able to do is set an alarm or tell me something about it it goes to wikipedia and gives the answer now imagine our visualization because both the technologies exist the text to speech speech to text and chat gpt now you are actually conversing with a device right so it, this is going to open plethora of things in the media space text is going to be significantly impacted gaming is going to be impacted in the video situation using the generative ai to create the video right so their deep fake is the even though unfortunately the name is not very popular but as a technology deep fake is very interesting in terms of actually replacing certain components and content sahil in the video space of the media do you have any ideas you want to share yeah for uh, video also there are some tools being created where uh, typically you can actually give the text and uh, you can primarily create a you know, message there are few you know startups last year we had a cadbury campaign right where multiple stars in india right so typically one time they record right and then they can typically give a new message and that entire message like they are talking will be also created even that is also happening Yeah, th- th- thanks sir yeah so so basically based on the theme you automatically create in the video is is happening and given a text line right like uh, for example i don't know we can pick um, I, i don't know whether i can pick any historical figure or not but i want to pick a, a neutral historical uh, figure right you can pick any historical figure and you want him to play cricket kind of picture to be created right the, today there are enough tools right that actually can actually create an image like that you pick to like i want einstein to play cricket with ramanujam right it actually nice puts a really reasonably nice kind of drawing with both of them right uh, i i want i don't know modi to play billiards with um, biden it can actually create an image of uh, they and it looks reasonably fine actually and i don't know how many are following like i think elon musk attending indian wedding i think on twitter somebody created right recently and he responded so so the the, the now all these fall into of course these are all fun things people are doing and all of these have a good impact on media and telecom of course any anywhere text exists in the workflows there's an impact thanks for addressing that question uh, so i guess maybe i have just one or two questions in my mind so shudhir abhi in terms of adoption of this technology what are the key headwinds in the near term you are seeing i mean we could see that data is everything around which you have to play around and as per accenture only 5 to 6% of the companies globally have actually moved their entire data sets to cloud so do you think in the near to medium term first the cloud migration data analytics cyber security kind of field will actually pick up before we actually start using large language models or the chat gpt tools around it this is in my opinion it is slightly different than the data right suddenly we are talking about the text right we are talking about a different problems right like the healthcare examples i have given or the edutech examples i have given we are talking about the textbooks here the question and answer students have done right which generally was not considered as a traditional data quote unquote right the traditional data is the orders customers information transaction information like that sales data and things like that right now or the customer support scenario where thousands of the documents that exist right the user manuals that exist now this is a completely different kind of data we are talking about right and the biggest barrier at this point in time in my opinion is the security right The, the your comfort to let go of this information outside of your network and microsoft already did make this announcement of like uh, open ai chat gpt kind of solution they'll provide in microsoft azure in a private environment right uh, people are generally paranoid especially when you are talking about the core information of yours now we are talking about all these product improvements now think about a company like a cisco or a samsung right if they are actually trying to do back and forth communication on one of their core 
designs of chipset right and microsoft having that information is extremely paranoid situation for them right and the same is true for even mid size company startups also like because you are actually trying to build a product that you haven't even announced to the world right those requirements you are putting back and forth so in our opinion our ability to actually host in a completely private data center is extremely critical that is probably going to be the biggest barrier and that's i think i'm i'm, I'm sure that that's obvious to microsoft also and the announcements were made and that is the first step that needs to be done now once that is done then the incremental cycle will start and there we are talking about a different kind of data here so uh, people will jump with the low hanging fruit when iot came everybody jumped into predictive maintenance use case right because i put the sensors the mission sends the data i'll detect the anomaly and i'll call technician right which is a classic use case everybody wanted to jump on right very similarly the the lowest hanging fruit in this case is customer support right because you want to reduce the cost there is a massive knowledge repository already and in respect of how much ever you train the customer support person he doesn't know all the cases that were discussed in the past nor the entire knowledge repository that exists the front first person that we are calling right by putting all this information i'm sure everybody jumps into the customer support as a first use case then slowly they'll start getting into more complicated use cases by using their textual information and at some point in time their data also gets integrated into that and then of course uh biggest project or the most money we get is not on the ai the most money we get from the services point of view is the data platforms for you to actually because you may have only 5 or 10 data scientists but you will be having 30 or 40 people who are building these data platforms because you have the disparate systems they are all supposed to be connected you cannot do analytics unless you have the data platform the same is bound to happen right for you to leverage you have to look at where your textual information is in what format it is there and all those things put in the cloud all these things security everything comes into picture and now the data is also expanding drastically with so much textual information right right so you believe both public and private cloud adoption will actually go up on the back of data curation sure. and another Okay. Sure. Yeah. Because because you are expanding the definition of data, right? In the previous example, the the service manuals was not considered as data. <laughs> yeah, data is in the traditional sense. So I have this ten thousand manuals. People look at it, or field support people look at it. Now suddenly that also became the data of the enterprise. Got it. No great. Thanks a lot, uh, Sridhar, for doing this session. I don't think we have any more questions. So I think this field is still evolving. and i think maybe 3 to 6 months down the line we can again revisit these questions with you and see i mean where the 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 industry has evolved so thanks again shridhar sahil and ritesh and sunil for your time and doing this session for us and i might think all of us thank you have a good day thanks, and thank you thank you, thank you very much thank you so much thank you everyone thanks sir